Good morning, Philippines! Good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, depending on where you are in the world. It is a great day as I welcome you to the second webinar of ProPAC Philippines. Today's theme is Philippines Packaging Trends, the Essentials of Safe and Sustainable Packaging, powered by Zoom and broadcast live by the Informa Markets. My name is Clark Nabrao and I'll be your moderator for today. We just want to let everyone know that we are also live on social media through ProPAC Philippines YouTube and Facebook accounts. Don't forget to use our hashtag, hashtag ProPACPH, again, hashtag ProPACPH for your posts and insights today. So just in case you get disconnected here on Zoom or couldn't get in, you may watch us through our live stream in our FB and YouTube accounts. Before we start, please be reminded with our housekeeping rules. All microphones and videos of the attendees will be automatically muted, and the chat box will be disabled throughout the sessions. If you have any questions to our speakers, please type it on the Q&A box, which you can see on top or at the bottom part of your screen, depending on which device you are using. Should there be any internet disruptions during the session, please be patient and try again and sign in. We would like to recognize also our partners who are with us today from the Packaging Institute of the Philippines, the Department of Trade and Industry, especially the Regional Operations Group, the Department of Science and Technology, the Department of Agriculture, and of course, our entrepreneurs all over the country. Towards the end of our webinar, we will ask you to complete our survey. So please take a minute to answer the survey before leaving us today. Your feedback will definitely help us improve our future events. To start the session, our first presenters will discuss on sustainable packaging. Where are we now? Are we there yet? So please welcome. Ms. Narida Kelton, MAIP, ANZ Board Member of the World Packaging Organization and Executive Director of the Australian Institute of Packaging. She will be joined by Mr. Ralph Moyle, FAIP, CPP, Education Coordinator of the Australian Institute of Packaging. So before they proceed with their presentation, let's see first what our attendees know about today's topic. For everyone watching, a poll question will pop up on your screen right now. Please select one correct answer and you have 10 seconds to actually answer. And as you answer, don't forget to click submit after your answer so that your answer will be included in the survey. So the question says, what is the most important what is most important, sustainability, food waste, or both are equally important? There, I see the, the votes being casted slowly. Yes, you only have 10 seconds. We're about to see all the votes coming in. And there you go, we're on our 75th percent. And there you go, the polls are closed. And let's take a look at what you guys think. What is most important? Majority or 82% answered both are equally important, followed by sustainability with 18%. And actually, no one answered food waste. Let's see. All right, now let's hear it from Sir Ralph Moyle and Miss Nerda Kelton. The floor is yours. Thank you very much, Clark. Mabuhai to everyone and welcome to uh, a wonderful day. And I'm looking forward to throughout this presentation uh, to stimulate some, some thoughts amongst you, uh, to challenge you with a few things, but also to give you quite a series of takeouts, things that you can take back to your role in your business to apply to, to benefit 
and add value wherever you are. So yes, that's my introductory thing. Where are we now? So we're gonna to touch on that. And certainly, uh, are we there yet? Are we there yet? It's like the, the classic with the kids in the car on a long journey, because this is a long journey and it is a transition and there will be turns in the road and there will be places that we'll be going to that we've not gone to before. But they're challenges that we all need to take on through this uh, particular topic of packaging and sustainability, circular economies and the like. So I hope you will find these, uh, the information that we all provide this morning of significant interest to you and your business. Yep, that's the pretty face, that'll do, enough of that. Uh, I'm here today to uh, represent the Australian Institute of Packaging. And I'm delighted of the developing relationship that we've had with the Philippines over recent years. I've been fortunate enough to come to your country on, on two occasions under ProPAC and a couple of others for my work trips. And I just, I miss going there. So I was there in February and I'm so looking forward to coming back. Who is the AIP for some of you? Well, we are a not-for-profit organization. Our focus is education for industry. And uh, we provide a whole range of, of different services to individual packaging technologists. We don't have any corporate membership. They're all uh, for individual packaging technologists. And I would like to just digress a little bit. There's one diamond there up in the, uh, the top right hand corner of a certificate in, in packaging and also certified packaging professionals. And I'd like to call out two fine young ladies from the Philippines today who have just recently qualified as a certified packaging professional. And that is a global, I repeat, a global certification to show that they are truly skillful packaging technologists. So Julianne Kruya from Oleo Fats, and certainly Ray C. Blen Aguirre from Aeropac. My sincere congratulations. And from everybody here, please give them a round of applause because that's a very serious uh, certification they've got. I also have it and you, you're given literally two days to complete the course. And trust me, you need just about all of it to do that. So well done, ladies, congratulations. I'm gonna to touch on three topics uh, in my brief presentation today. One is uh, circular economy and circular design. And I'm gonna to touch on the, on the benefits and, and why we're doing it and hopefully encourage you and your businesses to get increasingly involved with it. The next topic will be global sustainable packaging targets. So there are targets out there, they are about, and you and your business need to be fully aware of them. And also sustainable packaging guidelines. And there's a few takeouts in there that you can add back into your business and apply literally tomorrow. Circular economy, uh, it's a term used a lot these days. One of the driving forces certainly is the Ellen MacArthur Foundation, uh, a most interesting woman. So if you do get the time to go back and dig up and find out who she was and what she's done around the world, both in sailing and in business and in uh, general sustainable eco economics, it's, she's done a, a marvelous story to tell. So I do encourage you to go back and read who she is and why she does what she does. But this is the key elements here is is getting better value out of what we have. And the key word I'm gonna be using a lot this morning is designing. As you as packaging technologists and people involved with the packaging industry, you do have the power, you do have the skills. There's some education to go with it, which certainly the AIP can assist with. We're certainly designing out waste and pollution and keeping materials in use. And you can be making money out of it. That's not a separate target for me. You've got to be a financial and sustainable business as well as dealing with sustainable packaging. So there's some key elements there in that particular message. I think the key takeout I'd like to address here and I've tried to infer that is there's a traditional way of doing things. And I guess I was brought up with a lot of that. Uh, but the key aspect is you've got to go back and, and rethink in today's environment, what consumers want, uh, what the demands of the supply chain and the Philippines 
certainly has a very challenging supply chain is to go back and you've got to rethink the principles of why you're doing what you're doing with the materials and formats that you have at hand. But the bottom line is the key payout. I really want you to focus on no matter what you're doing or what area you're in. You must be seen to be adding value. Adding costs and complexities is not, this, not the solution. You still got to be seen to be adding value. So please focus on that is one of the key messages here. So who's doing what? This is a cute little one I found. I'm, I'm sure you guys are quite familiar with it, with the Coca-Cola partnered with uh, Peace Pond collecting bottles for uh, the Batik project. There's a full cycle plastic bottle collection and recycling program and volunteers use this pedicab to go out and collect it. Because we can look at multinationals such as Coca-Cola and I'll touch on them shortly and many others and yourself and your own businesses with the, your design and your format changes. But essentially, it, there's a, still a significant amount of consumer education required here is to keep the packaging out of the waterways, out of the oceans and into back into an area where those materials can be reused or recycled. I think one of the other key examples I take from uh, say Coca-Cola Philippines is, uh, not, is two. One, they have a substantial amount of their product is still packed in glass, which is collected and, and reused. It just needs to be uh, further education with the community on, on maintaining that and making sure that those bottles don't end up in waterways and the like. But Coca-Cola globally, and they've certainly achieved it in Australia, have moved entirely over to using recycled PET for the fabrication of their bottles. Uh, that is a program they've taken globally and they're well underway of achieving it within their targeted timeline. Yeah, this one's got a bit got a bit of text in it, folks. Sorry about that. But what I'm just trying to quantify here is from a financial point of view, what's the value in certainly having a, a circular economy? And the key takeout for me here, that's two trillion US dollars a year. That's not an insignificant sum by, by any stretch of the imagination. And there's the authorities who put it together. But certainly the development, production and maintenance of the circular products does add value to an economy. It's not there to add cost. You can be creative and be adding value wherever you go. There's significant readings available to you on the economics of this, which I'm not going to touch on this morning. The next uh, topic I'd like to, to touch on is from global sustainable uh, targets. And look, uh, this is just a, a very, very brief snapshot of some of the countries that are involved with it. <clears throat> Excuse me. I've just chosen a, a few, but they're major economies in this region, United States, India, China, Australia, Canada, and there's so many more. My purpose of mentioning this is that it's this isn't just a one little pop up in some isolated corner of California or the United Kingdom. This is seriously a global movement. And if the uh, businesses, either the suppliers that you engage with or the customers that you provide to are in any way export related and overseas, you really need to make, make yourself aware and your business aware of where they're heading because they'll be very much on this on this trajectory and you need to get on board and get on board rather smartly to be ensure that you're not left behind. So let's just clarify what we're really talking about here, about sustainability, what, what is it? Uh, there's many variations going around and, and I think that's, that's perfectly healthy, but, but I'd, I'd like to draw the comparison between, are we there yet? Well, not quite. Um, packaging, and that's the first paragraph, has got primary roles to fulfill. It always has, and I believe always will. But the sustainability is yet is just another layer on the top of that, which you have to consider. And that is simply that it has to perform, perform those primary functions, but it has to do it at a lower environmental impact compared with existing or conventional packaging. And that's where the creativity comes in, which, you'll, which you have the power to address, you and your business. And I'd like to point out that 
if you think you, you're going to be able to achieve this on your own, uh, firstly, I commend you, but I don't think you're going to quite make it, okay? One of the key aspects that to make to turn a company around and change its direction in with the sustainability targets or circular economy or many of these matters is that you certainly have to address it as a policy for your business. So the procurement is involved, the operations people are involved, the sales people are involved, the distribution and the whole team is involved. So one of the key factors that I'd like you to take out of this presentation today is if your business doesn't have a sustainability policy, it needs to get one. Now, you don't have to write a book about it. A page would normally be sufficient, concise vision for where your company is heading and you need to have the, the CEO sign off on it. Now, I've just put two examples on your screen of where you can get some uh, guidance and inspiration from this. There are many, many other options out there and some of your customers and suppliers may be able to provide you with some guidance. But I sincerely hope that you will tackle, this would be one of the very first things that you'd need to tackle if you haven't already done so. Oopsie, sorry, the Zoom button and me, are, we're getting there. Oh, I beg your pardon, now I'm going in the wrong direction. So, sorry, ladies and gentlemen need to get this back under control. There I am. One of the, what, from the United States, certainly Sustainable Packaging Coalition has been out for, in operation for well in excess of, of 20 years. And I think they've got some, some quite reasonable aspects there that you can utilize and dig into through, through the web. But the aspect that they're stressing here is is eliminating unfavorable materials, okay? That is one key thing that I would be recommending to each of you is to go and do an audit on your own packaging and understand better where it comes from and what's involved with it. And that would involve going to each of your suppliers and, and if you don't already have it, getting quite detailed specifications. And I just don't mean this on, on the primary pack, be that a bottle or a pouch or a jar, whatever. That's fine, but you also need to ensure that you've got details on the secondary packaging, the box, the tray, the shrink film, in which that is shipped through your supply chain. And if necessary, if you have tertiary packaging, you need to be aware of that. But also the packaging that your packaging comes in, the B2B, if you will. There's a whole collective there and understanding better what you're dealing with and how complex it is would be one, the number two step that I'll be recommending for you to implement into your business. SPC can get, provide you with some guidance and some checklists in that area. This isn't just about packaging, if you will. Um, there are many references. This one happens to be from the United Nations. Uh, they're the Sustainable Development Goals. As you will read through it, they're not just packaging related, they relate to many other facets as far as being global sustainability targets. Please don't ignore those. And there's certainly others within um, the new economy and the EU plastic strategy. There are many of these out there that you need to be alert to and whether they affect your particular business and your supply stream. Now, I've when I was researching for this, I was delighted to see how much work was actually happening actually in the Philippines. And you certainly, uh, back in last year, the National Review on Sustainable Development had some really quite startling outcomes. And I sincerely hope oh, each of you is up to date with how they are moving through your economy. But there is clear actions occurring in the Philippines for you to be aware of. That was one of my, my key takeouts. Um, this natural review uh, that came out to just at the end of, of uh, July of last year and the minister published this. So it's certainly out in your press. Uh, I sincerely hope, and there's been numerous other announcements and actions that have occurred certainly in the Philippines in recent times. Um, you'll be familiar with, uh, with many of these. My take out to you is this topic is alive and well and growing in the Philippines. 
And uh, if your business is, uh, is not keeping up with it, I would su suggest, strongly suggest within your, your group that you have some group meetings within your factory. And I'll touch on key details of how you're going to be uh, up to date and maintaining your sustainable and, and make some money with it. Don't be afraid of that. Uh, if plastics is one of the, the key areas of uh, packaging formats that are used in, in your particular business, uh, I would strongly suggest you read up in this area of the World Economic Forum back in 2016. Yes, I know that's a few years ago, but many of those aspects and directions that came from it are still very much in play today. And the, uh, the link at the bottom, I'd strongly encourage you, I'll just leave it up there for another couple of minutes uh, moments rather while you uh, jot that one down and I would uh, encourage you strongly if plastics are part of your packaging makeup that you, uh, you follow that point through. Okay let's move on. Right the third topic I'm touching on today is and this is a clear checklist takeout for for packaging technologists no matter whatever your business is you've got to have some design guidelines as how you're going to move from the present to the future. How are you going to start implementing these things within your environment, with your supply base, supply chain, and your customers? And we're going to touch on a few checklists that you can take out of this. So you hear these key guidelines. Now I'm just going to read this one because this is this is really an important part which will which will help you. Okay, you've got to integrate these package, sustainable packaging guidelines into different areas of your business. It isn't just at the front end with the marketers. It's just as important with the supply chain guys, the warehouse and the operations. Functionality is still an absolute key here. And it is very much a collective work. I stress that you can't do it on your own. It has to be a collective of your entire business. And when I've seen examples of how a business can take it on, especially when the CEO is, is on board with it, some of the changes that have occurred in, in what are really short periods of time have been quite staggering. Here's a couple of key takeouts is understand your position and your opportunities. So I've listed you need to know what your, your specifications are and understand the quantities and the implications of it. Have you got the right people around you in your business whom you can work with and you can assist them in their roles? The third one of reviewing your existing packaging. You might do that uh, first part and say, hang on, none of we've got a lot of materials here that are just simply not recyclable. So you've then got to perhaps have a rethink of what's the existing, you know, what other options can we convert to and bring your suppliers on board with that, saying, we bought, used to buy X from you, but we want Y now. So can you provide Y to us in a format that we can use and work within our equipment and within our cost restraints? Some of these journeys, and this is step four, this is a bit of the grind out stuff, but it's really important because there are times when it's gonna be bloody hard work, excuse the Australian side of expressing there. And people are going to start questioning it. But if you keep tracking and reporting every month what you've saved or what you haven't wasted, or what you haven't put to landfill and a number of other key measures that you agreed on, and you keep mapping it every month, everybody can see the journey that they're on. And they will find out, are we there yet? And the direction that you take will be you'll be feeding the information to you. So you may find that some of the measurements you're taking aren't of that much value, but others are exciting and others want to jump on board. So don't be afraid to change the direction. And last, but by no means least, is seek opportunities for continual improvement. That can be from your suppliers to bring them in board into your business. Understand better what your customers are after uh, from a very parochial, AIP point of view, if education is what's needed within your business, come and talk to us. We may already have courses available to you, half day type training sessions, which may suit your business and bring the whole education level up of the business so they understand better why they're doing what they're doing.
here's a couple of examples from um, from uh, Nestle where they've certainly gone in there and uh, and <coughs> excuse me and looked at their packaging designs and the straws and the like certainly with Tetra Pak and others so if the big boys are doing it you can be doing it as well now I'm just going to the next slide I'm going to touch on I'm going to leave it up there for a little while because those 10 points of a checklist are the core of the different steps that you need to work through when you're doing this review of, of your property. So you've got to design it from the start to recover it. So not going to landfill, for example. Material efficiencies, have you got the weights right? But you're not wasting things or to it's too little, it's causing damage, but is it too heavy and too excessive that you just got simply got too much packaging there? Are you actually damaging product through your supply chain? We'll go and find out. If you're dealing with hazardous materials, that's quite a unique area, but they certainly need to be isolated and treated exclusively. Recycled materials. I think this is where your suppliers come in. Go and ask them. If I've got a corrugate board and it's, it's purely craft, go and ask them, why can't I have 30 to 40% recycled content in this board? You may be very surprised that they were never asked for it, but it is commonly available around the world in some places up to 90 to 100 percent and still providing uh, adequate functionality. Always designed to minimise litter. I think that's the, the tragedy that affects our industry where people keep reminding me of the plastic bottles that are in streams and the ocean. Well, they didn't walk there on their own. They got there with the assist of people. So how can we minimise litter? Transport efficiency a most underrated area of investigation by a packaging technologist, maximising your pallet loads and your truck loads. There's money for old rope there, guys, so don't ignore that one. And accessibility. There's massive demographics in all of our societies of those who are elderly or physically impaired who have difficulty opening any packaging formats, and we seriously need to consider that. And don't forget to tell your consumers what you're doing. My last slide before I by, before I hand over to, to Nerida. When you're working in your teams at your, your business and you want to know well, which one's more important than the next and you want a sort of a decision-making tree, this waste hierarchy is ideal. And the very first one, of course, is avoidance reduction, okay? And you work your way down that tree. Share that particular hierarchy with all your staff around you and the explanations will become so much more clear to all and you'll have the team working for you and I wish you very well in that journey I'm now going to hand over to Nerida Kelton and she's going to take you through the next phase of this presentation Nerida over to you thank you Ralph sorry we're just waiting for the control to My apologies, there seems to be a bit of a lag. Lynn, would you be able to put your mouse on the bottom left-hand corner, please, just so that we can activate the slides? Sorry, everyone, I'm just having difficulty getting the mouse to move. Uh, Lynn, I might get you to actually change the slides if that's okay. So if you just change it to the next slide, please. Okay. 
So Lynn, if you could please change to the next slide, that would be wonderful, thank you. So thank you, good morning, good afternoon, um, and good evening to everyone around the world that's joined us today. Um, I'm going to start off talking off the back of what Ralph was discussing to do with sustainable packaging. And the best way to talk about it is to show you examples. So the World Star Packaging Awards are owned and operated by the World Packaging Organization. They are run on an annual basis and they have a special award category which has been taking um, a lot of momentum this year, uh, the last couple of years, and it's sustainable packaging design. So if you change to the next slide, please. Sorry, everybody. Seems to be a bit of an issue with the slides. Hi, Miss Kelton. Good morning. Um, just please uh, click on the right ha uh, hand side of the screen so you can move or push the slides. Thank you. Okay, sorry everybody. Um, so the first example is um, the World Star Gold winner for 2020. This was just announced a couple of weeks ago. It actually um, happened to come out of an Australian uh, program, awards program, which is the Peter Awards. Um, and this is for packed group for a dairy creamery in New Zealand called Lewis Road. Um, the reason that this one was that it actually transferred um, a glass bottle um, into a recycled content PT bottle. Um, they tried to maintain the look and feel of a glass bottle, um, but put it into the recycled PT. The savings were significant in terms of environmental impact, and they also reduced a significant amount of packaging and plastics for this pack. The silver award winner also came out of Australia and I, 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 <laughs> I didn't judge this just so everybody understands that. Um, and this was for our largest retailer, Woolworths Australia, for replacing um, an entire bakery range of their um, packaging. And they replaced it from the non-recyclable black trays into recyclable pulped-based fibre trays. Once again, as you'll see, and something that Ralph did mention as well, track and measure. And when you measure, communicate your measurement and achievements to your consumers. So if you have a look on the left-hand side on the slide, you'll see the significant um, outcomes and achievements that they did when they swapped over from the black recyclable, non-recyclable trays. Sorry. Um, can someone, sorry, can someone help with the slides, please? My apologies, you can't control technology. Um, so the third one was, um, the bronze winner was Yasa Packaging. Yasa Packaging is a Netherlands company. It's called Bag to Paper. Um, it's a new technology. It sits on a vertical form fill and seal system. It's recyclable. It has um, a self-adhesive system um, and it's actually ideal for potatoes, onions, nuts, seeds and bulbs. And then if we go down to some examples for Australia and New Zealand, just to show you some local examples. Ralph already touched on this. Coca-Cola replaced all of their 
um, uh, previous bottles into a recycled PET, um, so post-consumer recycled PET, and they actually transferred their whole range of sensi sensitive warm filled aseptic packaging and they have um, had a 55% tonnage um, replacement when they moved over to the recycled content. The um, one that you'll see in front of you is a cherry punnet. It's actually in New Zealand. Um, and one of the unique features of this is not only did they move to a recycled PET in their punnet, but they also, also designed with the help of UPM Raffletac a self-adhesive washable label that actually washes off in the recycling stream. So it doesn't contaminate the recycling systems in New Zealand and Australia. This one is a wonderful example of fresh produce, a really simple thing. It replaced a, a non-recyclable plastic liner with a carton board liner with a, with a paper-based liner. Um, simple, easy, cost-effective, and made a significant difference to their environmental footprint. When you're looking at e-commerce as a space and a, and a wonderful category of what's working really well in sustainable design, um, eliminating polystyrene, eliminating bubble wrap, um, getting rid of all the unnecessary single-use plastics um, that you don't need within your boxes, within your secondary and your outers, replacing them with paper. Um, sorry, I'm not sure what's happening. I've lost the screen. I think there's some gremlins in the computers today. So when we're talking about the balance, we talked about some examples of sustainable packaging, but we also need to talk about food waste. So when you are a food producer or you're designing food packaging, you really do need to ensure that you're considering both sustainable packaging design and the principles and guidelines for, for sustainability, but you also need to consider the packaging and the true role that packaging plays to minimize food waste. So food waste, everybody knows, is a global issue. It is approximately one third of the food produced is wasted in this world. And what does that look like? It looks like this. In Australia alone, we lose about 7.3 million tonnes of food every year that ends up in landfill. And this is food that could be given to people that need it. If you look at that picture, that is 298 kilograms of food that every single person in Australia wastes every year. Sorry, there is incredible lag on this today. So why is food waste an issue? Well, food waste is a massive issue because it has significant greenhouse gas emissions. And it is one of the highest causes of greenhouse gas emissions in the world. We need the food to feed people that actually require it. Um, there are many people going around the, around the world that are starving every single day, and yet we're dumping millions and millions of tonnes of food into landfill all the way around the world. So packaging plays a role. Packaging plays a significant role in minimising food waste. So when you're having the conversation with your teams about designing your packaging for your food products, you need to consider the true purpose of packaging, the fundamental role of packaging, which, which Ralph touched on, 
But you also need to start thinking about all the smart, new, intuitive features that can be added to save food packaging design to preserve, protect, extend shelf life, um, ensure that consumer convenience, on-pack communication, better portion control, but all the while making sure you have a low carbon footprint and a low environmental impact. And that's always a challenge when you're designing. You're always going to be challenged between the sustainable packaging aspect and then the safe food packaging design aspect to make sure that you get that sweet spot, to make sure that you have that optimum pack design that ensures that you're not wasting food, but you're also not wasting packaging materials. So we've been working on for quite a few years, some guidelines, safe food packaging guidelines. And the next two slides are the ones that I'd like for you to take a photo of and you'll obviously get access to this later. But this is to help you when you're designing your packaging to consider all areas that you can input into your design when you're in your NPD processes to make sure that you are designing the best packaging possible that's not only sustainable, but also minimizes food waste. So consider designing to contain and protect the product from spoilage damage through manufacture, warehouse, and all stages of distribution. And what does that look like? As Ralph already touched on, that's primary, secondary, and tertiary. Your palletization, your transport, your load utilization, tamper evidence, and also all of your vibration and, and um, uh, shock and testing. Um, you need to design to preserve, enhance product appeal and extend shelf life. And this is a critical area for improved and more advanced packaging design in this, in this space. You need to consider how you have your barrier, your extension of shelf life, retaining nutrition. Um, and some of the ways that you can do this is by incorporating active and intelligent packaging, um, sensors, indicators, smart labels, and there's quite a lot of um, amazing innovations on the market at the moment. And I would encourage you to consider incorporating active and intelligent packaging into your design. We would like you to consider designing to provide convenience to not waste the food when handling. Um, a lot of households these days have changed from five, six people down to two and three. So what that means is a lot of the, the brands are now actually reducing the amount of food that they're putting in their packs. They might have multi-packs, they might have smaller packs, and that's for consumer convenience. And it's also a way to not waste food. So if you know that you're a household of two, don't buy the big, big tray of mints, buy the small tray so that you're not wasting the food in your household. Um, ease of opening, resealability, making sure that you have controlled dispensing. They're all critical areas for minimizing food waste, but they're also really important areas in terms of accessible and inclusive design. If you can't open the pack or you struggle to open it, you're going to spill it. If you can't close it or reseal it, you're going to waste the food. So please consider these as some really great features when you're designing your packaging. We also would encourage everybody to look at better on-pack communication. So better on-pack communication is explaining whether it's recyclable, whether your packaging has recycled content, whether it extends shelf life, um, ideas for recipes, ideas for storage and instruction, um, explanations on whether the food is appropriate to put in a freezer. And they're all areas that can minimize food waste and communicate an, a, a sustainable journey um, that your company is doing all the way through to the consumer. And then obviously, wherever you are in the world, you must be making sure that it's sustainable. You need to make sure that it's meeting your global and regional targets. So what does this look like? It looks like this. So here's some examples of uh, safe food packaging design that has won global awards. Um, this is um, Hazel Dean chicken, and this is all around consumer convenience, portion control, um, making sure that it's freezer ready, it's easy to open, it has a tear tab on the top right hand corner, and it's for two people. 
This one is the Silver Award winner for the World Star Awards, which was just announced last month. And this is for the Chinese market where um, re in regional areas, they buy quite a lot of eggs. Um, on average, a household of four consumes over 40 eggs a week within their food, um, within, a, with it, with, within their cooking. And this is designed as an extended polypropylene, expanded polypropylene, um, reusable, um, it's modular, it's flexible, so they can actually go back, refill it for their next order and keep using it at home. This one's come out of America. This is from Playcon. Um, what I like about this is the way that it's designed to tip and tilt and it doesn't actually leak and it doesn't, um, there's no spoilage if you're tipping it. So if you're transporting it as a takeaway, it's, it's a wonderful concept, very intuitive, obviously recyclable. Um, they've made sure that the pack and the lid are the same material so that it's recyclable all the way through the existing streams in the USA. Um, some other examples which are different um, and again give, should hopefully give you a few ideas. This is going back to that whole concept of accessible packaging design. Um, this is for dysphagia patients in hospitals and, and, and obviously uh, aged care facilities. It's designed so people can hold it grip it, it's got very large font on it, it has a massive pull tab, grip tab that they can actually open, it reseals and then obviously they can refill it with their next food and they use the cup over and over again. This one is my absolute favourite, this is a New Zealand avocado farm that was ploughing avocados back into field they were wasting so much of their food, they couldn't find another alternative. And they come, came up with the concept of, of developing a guacamole paste that they could export. They then worked with um, a company to produce a skin pack, um, consumer convenience, small portion control for the export market. And it's also been designed, the pack's been designed to extend shelf life by 90 days. And this is the best example that you will see right now on from farm to plate on safe food packaging and also minimizing food waste. This one was designed by chefs um, for restaurants and also eventually moved into for consumers and it's still available um, on our shelves, but it was designed for one month's worth of herbs and spices. Um, you can buy them, the options are you can buy them in a small container, so small portion, uh, portion control, for consumer convenience, which is actually refillable, or you can buy them in the sachets on the left. Um, they did some research on this and they worked out that that was the exact amount that an average household of four people would use within their cooking for one month. This is for hospitals. Again, there are a lot of issues with hospitals, with food waste, um, particularly not, I mean, if anyone, any of you that are listening has been in hospital, you know, if you're not feeling well, you're not that hungry. If you can't open your packaging or you can't reseal your packaging, it's gonna get wasted. So this is a wonderful area category to consider um, because we need to do more in this space to make sure that it's easy to open, easy to reclose, resealable, very legible font, clear communication on pack um, and making sure that it's in a small portion so that there's no food wasted. And then my last slide is to let you know that the FAO has developed for the first time ever uh, a food loss and food waste day. And this is a day of awareness. It's on the 29th of September. And I would encourage all of you to go away and think about what you can do in your homes, in your work environments and within your business to minimize food waste wherever possible. Reuse, buy less, um, redesign all your packaging to make sure that you're not wasting food and I hope to see you online on the 29th of September, um, promoting what, you've, what you're doing and what, or the changes that you're going to put into effect to make sure that we stop food waste and loss around the world. So thank you. And my apologies for the technology.
Thank you very much for that insightful presentation, Ralph and Merida. Uh, for me, the sustainability po policy and the packaging guidelines are really very helpful uh, because I'm an entrepreneur and uh, uh, it's good to look, look at it and really make a policy now for my company. I'm also excited as well how the Philippines can fare with the World Star Packaging Awards because uh, we've seen former winners from the Philippines on these awards through the Phil Star Packaging Awards of PIP as well. So uh, my, my, my key takeaway for uh, uh, the talk of Ralph and uh, Nerida is just really minimize and manage your waste or your litter. And so as we uh, go through our uh, session, let us see if our attendees still have the same answer on our poll question earlier. Let's see. Let's put in our poll question again and answer the poll question. You have 10 seconds to answer so that we see if there's some movements on our response. So again, the poll question earlier was, what is the most important? Is it sustainability? food waste, or both are equally important. We're almost 50% of the votes being casted. Uh, we're almost done, almost uh, on. There you go. The poll results are finished and we have an 86% reply for both are equally important or 86%. And then there was sustainability at 10% and food waste at 5%. I think there's a little bit of movement between the sustainability votes and the food waste votes. So with that in mind, I would like to ask Ralph and the Nerida uh, for your insights on what were your thoughts on these changes in this uh, uh, poll results. Okay, look, I'll go first uh, on that one, Clark. Look, it's a, it's a challenge, and that's what we've really pitched to you guys today, is they're both important. You can't just have one without the other. So the fact that we've moved a few people, but my first take it as the, the initial result is you already got it. The great majority of you already got it, that you've got to manage both. And you will find occasions, hopefully not too many, where one may conflict with the other, especially if you go down in serving size to protect and, and utilize all the food, then obviously the amount of packaging relative to the food goes up, which isn't necessarily one of the main plans. But the nu nutrition of our, our people is, is, is critical uh, from a pure sustainability point of view. The amount of energies, water, power, people, the whole lot that goes into growing food is substantially greater than what it is for almost every packaging format. So there's a good message there. Narrative, have you any thoughts that you'd like to add to that? I, I think that it was very pleasing to see the results and I'm very proud of all of you because sometimes we have a, um, we're challenged with this conversation, particularly if we're in front of a pure sustainability um, audience, um, small portion control, um, consumer convenience and changing household ranges is in effect a contradiction in some areas to sustainable packaging targets and design. So you need to consider the carbon footprint and environmental impact of the production of the food and the production of the packaging all the way through the supply chain when you make your decisions. I would add that, and I haven't touched on this because it's for another day, life cycle assessment is critical to this so that you can actually have a research science-based data that proves the decisions that you're making so that if you are moving from a single-use plastic bag, for example, to a, um, a paper bag, that you have the LCA behind it to prove the reasons why because sometimes it isn't as black and white as just moving over to something that appears to be more sustainable. You have to really research and make sure you've got the science with the LCA to prove 
why you've done what you've done so that you have an answer to a consumer. And you, that could even mean staying in a plastic non-recyclable pack, but you've got to have the data behind it. Thank you for that, Nerida and Ra. We'll actually get back to you shortly as we uh, go to our next speaker. We'll, we'll answer and we'll reply to most of the questions in the Q&A box later during the Q&A portion of our program. So now on the second and final presentation to discuss about the Philippine packaging trends, the essentials of safe and sustainable packaging. Please welcome Commissioner Crispian Lau, the Vice Chairman and Commissioner for the Recycling Sector for the National Solid Waste Commission under the Office of the President. He is also the founding president of the Philippine Alliance for Recycling and Material Sustainability. Thank you very much. Clark? I guess with that, uh, before you go to your presentation, Commissioner, let's have another question for our attendees. There you go. You'll have another 10 minutes, I uh, 10 seconds to actually answer the poll question, what is the percentage of packaging waste per disposal? Less than 50%, less than 30%, or less than 20%? There you go. We have the votes coming in, being casted by our participants. And we're almost there. There's a close result from our there you go, we are now closing the results and we have less than 20%, uh, those who answered less than 20% are 40% of those who voted and then less than 50% is next at 34% and less than 30% uh, answered with about 26% of our uh, participants. That was really a close uh, polling result. There you go. So, Commissioner, what are your thoughts on that uh, quick poll, poll results that we have? It's very close. Yeah, definitely. No? At the end of the day, it's really the perspective. I think uh, seminars like this allow us to understand more what type of packaging we are using. Uh, is this type of packaging you know, meant for disposal, meant for recycling? At the end of the day, how much really is the waste generated by you and I um, and the whole country? And how is it being managed? So these are the things that we would like to look into and I'm hoping to share during this round of presentation. Wow, we're excited to actually hear from you, Commissioner. All right, now let's hear it from Commissioner Lau. The floor is yours. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, I think for this session today, I would be uh, talking on behalf of the private sector on as farms. Um, right, let me see if, I, okay. Uh, well, just a brief look um, in, into the market, no? the population, 100 million population, that's a 100 million market. Uh, we have. Uh, what's interesting is that uh, 7,641 islands in the Philippines. Um, at least only 2,000 of those islands are inhabited. But uh, even given that, it is always a challenge for the transport of goods to ensure that the packaging would be strong enough, would be resilient enough to deliver the goods to the markets uh, it is designed for uh, at, at safe, uh, 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 safe and secure. Uh, when it gets to the consumers. And of course, the Philippines is a thingy market, as we call it. No? Uh, we, uh, most of our population who belong to the low-income class uh, buy in small portions. And let's face it, uh, even people from the higher income, middle income or higher income class uh, are, are also patronizing uh, smaller packets because of convenience. No? Um, if we look at the sachet, and uh, where we have also been criticized as a sachet economy, um, the sachet was really designed 
so that we can deliver pack, uh, packaged products safely to our consumers at small volumes where the demand is bigger. Um, if we remember in uh, a long time ago, and it even exists now, uh, you, you used to have like unbranded packaging you know, uh, that goes to the market uh, and that's sold in the market. Um, a lot of those have been replaced by branded goods. And it, uh, with that format of packaging, it created, you know, a separate problem for us. And that is more on solid waste. Now let's look at solid waste situation in the Philippines. Um, oops. Okay. Uh, each and every one of us uh, would generate about 0.3 to 0.7, no? 44,000 tons of day, uh, tons per day of waste generated by the whole of Philippines. If you're in Metro Manila, that's around 10,000 tons per day. 52% of our waste really is biodegradable. You know, you have set, uh, 27 to 30% which are recyclable right now, and residuals, no? residuals that need to be disposed of at the end of its life, um, and uh, is actually about 17.98 or 18%. Out of the residuals, um, roughly about 10 to 15% of that is really in different formats of packaging. Uh, if we dive deeper into the data, um, plastics would be about 5% to a maximum of 8% of the total residuals. Uh, so um, it, uh, there's a lot of calls for removing or, or banning single-use plastics, um, you can understand that that impact may not be that big when you look at the whole spectrum of waste. And on the right side, you'd see where the sources of waste is coming from. Most are coming from residential and institutional sources. For commercial and industrial, uh, it's the government does not really need to take care of it. Uh, most of us in industry will have to manage our own uh, industrial and commercial waste uh, for proper treatment or disposal. The next slide should show you, if I can get there, the states of updates. No? Uh, to date, only 31% of the population uh, of, the, or of the local government units or barangays are served by material recovery facilities. Uh, uh, we, the, this is where we need a lot of catching up to do. The infrastructure is simply not there so that you recover the materials. And, and if you look at uh, compliance study landfills, only 30% of the population has access to the sanitary landfills, or that equates to about 14% of the local government units. This had already improved in the recent past. Um, it is now at about 20 to 20, that is growth of our economy and the increase in our population. Then the next slide is I can get there. So, um, yeah, while waiting for it's really challenged by the lack of infrastructure. And unless uh, the infrastructure is set up, you know, um, this is partly the reason why, you know, leakage is very high. Uh, let's look at the existing system in the Philippines. Okay, uh, the lag is getting me to, okay. Uh, the, the existing system in the Philippines is such that segregation is mandatory in each and every household. Uh, we are required to segregate our waste based on biodegradable, recyclable, and residual waste. Uh, unfortunately, because of that lack of infrastructure, when a garbage picker or, or when a hauler comes to your house, they will just take everything and bring, it, bring everything to a landfill. In an ideal scenario, Biodegrade, there should be a separate system for biodegradable uh, materials, separate system for recyclable and residual, so that we can make maximum use of our resources. You see, if you mix everything together, your recyclables will already be contaminated with biodegradable. 
uh, and uh, th that becomes a bigger challenge because everything else sticks, stinks. No? So I encourage everyone to really develop a food waste management program. Just separate all your food away from your other, um, other waste because it's the food that will stink. And you will see that if you are able to do that, uh, there are less stinking food waste that needs to be managed. And of course, you also need to manage your, uh, your uh, uh, hazardous waste coming from your households with a big portion of uh, masks coming in because of COVID. Now the recommendation, and I understanding that there is not an existing hazardous waste management system, the recommendation is really for you to put all your masks uh, uh, in one yellow bag or uh, a bag that you tag as infection, spray it with this in weight about two to COVID uh, to other uh, to our waste pickers. No? Now let's look into the landscape. Um, okay. I'm experiencing another lag. Uh, right now, the system for for infectious waste would only apply to the hospitals. No? Uh, there is a system uh, right now where all hospitals are required to have the waste treated prior to disposal in a dedicated cell in a landfill. Now, when we discuss, uh, when you talk about packaging, you know, the question is how, you know, what choices do I have? Uh, how do I make the right choice? Huh? So this is where life cycle thinking needs to come in. And this is where circularity needs to come in. Uh, if you are a packaging practitioner here in the Philippines, you have to understand the local landscape. What materials uh, in the life cycles thinking, you have to look into uh, what materials are locally available because transport of materials also have a big impact in greenhouse gases. Um, now I'm not getting my next slide. Okay, then, then the question is, if you need to make that type of a choice, uh, what, what choices are available? Do you go reusable? Do you go recyclable? Do you go durable? Do you go repair, repairable? Do you go less packaging? Or do you want to go no packaging at all? But then you still have to strike a balance between what you need to do, uh, what you have to do, or responsibility of protecting that product and ensuring that the product is safely delivered to your consumers, especially on uh, food applications. And uh, we, we can't highlight enough from a packaging point of view, the importance of packaging to prolong or extend the life or, uh, of food so that there's no food wastage experience. Now in doing this, um, okay. Uh, my waste hierarchy is a little bit different from uh, the waste hierarchy of Ralph. No? This is the waste hierarchy that is being observed by the Philippines. Uh, first, you avoid. No? Avoidance, avoid producing waste. Um, so if you can generate avoidance of waste, uh, if, and you can apply this to packaging also. If you design your packaging so that it, it uh, does not end up in waste, you, know, you take out unnecessary, what we call, or what a lot of people would call unnecessary. But un unnecessary, I guess, is a relative term. What may be unnecessary to you is necessary to uh, somebody else in a different income class. No, uh, if you can't avoid, you have to reduce. No, reduce the uh, avoid, uh, reduce the amount of waste that you generate, reuse as much as we can, recycle, then recover and prior to final disposal. So this should be a guiding principle uh, that has to be followed. And we need to transition from linear economy for what we need or what we cannot avoid, which is the take, use, and dispose 
to a circular economy where we can look into re, uh, recovering the materials for reuse again. Um, uh, when we talk of circular economy, there are different interpretations of how circular economy is. No? Uh, some people view biodegradable materials uh, for composting and then um, circularity in non-biodegradable materials. But you also have to look into the local infrastructure that you have. Uh, if we shift packaging to bioplastics, do you have uh, the industrial compost plant to be able to process the end of life packaging material? Remember, a lot of bioplastics that are in the market right now are not capable of being composted together with your other compostable waste. And you have to understand also that in the Philippines, we already have a problem with the biodegradable waste that is being generated. That's why a lot of our bio waste are still picked up from our homes and sent to the sanitary landfills where it does not really belong. And having those uh, in uh, having having bio component in the landfills uh, would be uh, would be emitting greenhouse gases in the form of methane. Now, do we go for reusables? You know, uh, there's a lot of promotion to go your eco bags, to go reusables, uh, get away from single use plastic. Um, think about on the life cycle thinking. You have to consider your water resources. Do you have enough water to shift? all packaging to reusables. And more importantly, do you have the proper infrastructure for wastewater treatment yeah, uh, to, 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 um, uh, to manage wastewater? Uh, because uh, in the Philippines, th this is still one of the bigger challenges that we have uh, is really uh, the, the water treatment. We do not have a sewer line. Uh, only a limited uh, amount of uh, localities have sewer lines. No? And that's why your rivers are always polluted. Now, do we go for a refill system? Do we replace the sachets in your Sari Sari store and convert it into refilling stations? Um, yes, this is a possibility as long as you can ensure that what is actually the, the content that is actually being sold is the correct brand or the right brand. You know, uh, in, in this country, there's still a lot of proliferation a lot of fake materials. So these are some things that need to be addressed. But in the Philippines, uh, companies like Unilever are looking into it, uh, looking into systems as to how this can be done. Um, they, they have been successful in doing some of this in at the level of supermarkets, but not yet at the level of Sari Sari store. And then we have recycling. Now you have to understand the infrastructure for recycling in the Philippines. Uh, of course, you have plastics, paper, glass, uh, steel, aluminum. These are highly recyclable materials. But are all of these recyclable? You see, you have to look at what are recyclable in the Philippines. Yeah? Uh, for paper, if you shift to paper, these are the paper products that are recyclable in the Philippines. Right. These are the th uh, on the left side. You would see things that you cannot recycle. Right. Uh, you know, basically for paper, anything with food contamination, anything that is wet is no longer recyclable. And you also have to engineer it to a recycle. And just a reminder that coat coated paper contaminated with food waste is not recyclable here in the Philippines. So if we look at uh, uh, what we have done so far with local policies, um, we have shifted a lot of consumption from the dreaded you know, styrofoam packaging, uh, uh, which everybody complained is an issue. But we have shifted to a lot of coated packaging that is not recyclable and that, all, uh, and that ends up as waste just the same. So these are some of the things that you have to consider and you have to look at local infrastructure. So for plastics, PET is a highly recyclable material. Uh, it, uh, it commands one of the highest values as far as the waste is concerned. Uh, we, at present, we, we bail it for export, but there will be very soon a facility in the Philippines that would convert you know, your, your PET waste bottles back to bottles. Um, um, Coca-Cola is spearheading this project. 
And to enhance recyclability, you would notice that the Sprite, which used to be in green bottles, are now clear because this improves recyclability also of the bottles. So um, you take out the print, you take out the color. So the less contamination you have on the material, uh, the less costly it would be for it to be recycled. And remember, in recycling, you have to have certain economic volumes for it to make sense. Now, if everybody wants to use green bottles, you have to have at least 20 tons uh, of, of uh, bottles, green bottles per hour for it to be uh, to, to make sense for recycling. Then you have rigids. Almost all rigid materials are recyclable and, are, uh, and there are uh, existing facilities in the Philippines that recycles them. Uh, for flexibles, if it can be recovered and it would be recovered relatively clean, there are facilities that can recycle also non-biodegradable flexible uh, films. Then, of course, uh, I, I mentioned this already, what used to be plastic cups, styrofoam, straws, um, cutleries, spoon and fork. You know, these are highly recyclable in the Philippines. Um, and, uh, and again, do we take all of these materials out and shift it uh, to paper alternatives that we need to throw away? And this is, these are just some of the things that we do with the foam polystyrene. Uh, for recycling, what the industry does. And of course, uh, there is a huge recycled plastic market in the Philippines. You know? uh, what used to be in your uh, carabaos uh, selling rattan furnitures, you know, you, you'd find a lot of people right now going around in bicycles this time, uh, selling all these uh, plastic products. And these are mostly made out of recycled plastics. Now, a quick introduction of Farms Who Are We. Uh, we are the Philippine Alliance for Recycling and Material Sustainability. The objective really is to bring together the different sectors of the uh, value chain and the waste chain from corporate members, uh, brand owners, we have the industry groups, the retail, the junk shops, the MRFs, um, uh, even the waste pickers are, are represented. We have the civil society and the academic community and we are supported by the government. Um, these are some of our investing partners uh, and also technology partners, some of the academic community that are with us right now. We are growing uh, at, a, at a steady and at, at, at a very strong pace. Um, some of our in initiatives would include increased recycling, again, using the local context, um, post-consumer waste solutions for those we cannot recycle now, Innov innovation in packaging, so redesign it for recyclability, developing offtake prices, enabling investments really in the recycling uh, uh, facilities, uh, and evidence-based policy advocacy. These are some of the things that we are working on. And uh, in January of 2020, we declared a zero waste to nature ambition uh, in partnership with the uh, uh, 11 um, of the biggest uh, global and local brand owners here in the Philippines. Uh, and our concept is a for our approach to reduce, to reuse, to recover or collect and recycle the materials so that it ends, uh, does not end up as waste. Now we have subsector groupings that we have developed already. Uh, we are dealing with, uh, and the, this would be focused materials that we are uh, looking at with the 2030 ambition, such as uh, pet or beverage bottles, uh, plastic bags, uh, food bags, plastic cups, cutlery, straws, and stirrers, paper bags, and coated paper. Uh, what we are trying to do now is to look at the, the, the whole landscape, the total volumes, uh, identify what we can shift, how we can shift it, and what of, uh, type of infrastructure is needed. So um, these materials, not, uh, more often than not, it is highly contaminated. So with this, uh, I'd like to thank you very much. Thank you, ProPAC, for inviting me uh, to this event. Thank you. Thank you so much, Commissioner Crispian Lau, for updating us of the existing safe and sustainable packaging situation of the country. It's also an eye-opener for us for the waste hierarchy and an up-to-date situation of our packaging options in the country. 
Of course, I know everyone has been waiting for this moment, so we shall proceed with our question and answer portion as we bring back our three panelists for this morning. To ask our speakers to type in your questions on the Q&A box, which you can see at the top or at the bottom of your screen, again, depending on the device you are using. So let's start the question and answer portion of our program this morning. We'll read some of the questions uh, that are placed at the Q&A. Uh, I think this one is for Ralph. Ralph, how to balance sustainability solution with product safety compliance, green packaging concepts, following circular economy model, but may violate the persistent organic pollutants, compliance requirements? Actually, I think that's a, thanks for the question. It's actually a very easy one to answer. And that is, um, First, second, and third in the food, food industry is safe food. Not negotiable, not interchange with any other point. You must and have to produce safe food for the consumer. And uh, without that, you, you, you won't be selling anything and uh, it would be disastrous for your business. So actually that point of decision is, uh, is really easy. Safe food, always the first choice. Mm -hmm. Thank okay. you, Clark. Thank you for that. <laughs> And uh, uh, what are the types of materials that are easy to recycle? Also, do you have an idea if there are recycling establishments here in the Philippines? Maybe this one can go to uh, Commissioner Lau. Commissioner De Crispian. Okay, uh, yeah, I, I, I believe uh, I was cut off, but I think the question is uh, what are the materials that are easy to recycle? As I've shown, uh, um, the easiest to recycle would be rigid packaging. You know, anything that uh, the junk shop would buy is something that would be easy to recycle. You know, you don't look at the material, the recyclability of the material alone. You also have to look at the infrastructure that collects, uh, the whole infrastructure behind the collection and getting those materials uh, to the uh, to the re recycling facilities for for, uh, for recyclability. If you're looking at recyclability, and you would see that uh, the the packaging has evolved in the Philippines also uh, with COVID, with a lot of delivery systems right now. You don't get your food in plastic bags anymore. You get your food in microwavable, polypropylene, um, re uh, re usable, recyclable containers. So this is where we would want to drive our uh, packaging industry um, um, to, uh, uh, so that it becomes a lot more sustainable than it is right now. And then a follow-up question, uh, Commissioner. Do we have suppliers of recycled packaging materials in the Philippines, specif specifically for the PET bottles? Okay, uh, the, the facility is yet to be put up. Um, it's a slight delay because of COVID, but uh, the, the investors are committed to put up that facility in the Philippines. Uh, and again, our pet will be available in the Philippines in the next three to five years, I should say. Mm. And then uh, uh, Nerida can answer this question about uh, if you or AIP or uh, uh, the World Packaging is actually conducting trainings on sustainable packaging design. They wanted to know more uh, what are our services for AIP and the World Packaging for the sustainable packaging design. Uh, thank you for that, Clark. Um, absolutely, yes. Um, and not, um, not only, so AIP can assist all of Asia. So we cover Asia, um, Australia and New Zealand. So we can help you but also through the World Packaging Organization, um, I can put people in contact with uh, additional courses, but um, the AIP have a significant amount of sustainable labeling, future of flexibles, um, introduction to sustainable packaging, design guidelines, et cetera. We have about eight courses already written and developed that 
um, are available to everybody in the Philippines at any time and anywhere else in, in, in Australasia. Thank you for that, Merida. Uh, for Commissioner Lau, again, would you know why most LGUs are not providing also segregated collection of garbage? Households are discouraged because the collection puts everything together during collection po. Thanks. <laughs> Uh, well, again, it, it uh, boils down to lack of infrastructure and lack of, lack of funding for the local government units you know, to develop the, the, the whole system behind it. Uh, for example, um, biodegradable waste. Uh, biodegradable waste is supposed to be managed at the barangay level. But where are you going to compost 5,000 tons of waste per day in Metro Manila when you don't have the space to compost it, right? So uh, again, um, waste management can be very costly, but it should not refrain us individuals from doing what we need to do to comply with the law. Then I guess you just have to sue your mayors if they're allowing mixed collection of dirt. Uh, but having said that, if you look at the way waste is being hauled from your households, um, if you are able to separate your recyclables, you know, these guys, would take out recyclables from your house and there are things in the track where they can put Quezon City, they have separate collection schedules for bio and non-bio. Yeah, I think uh, I agree with that commissioner because here I'm from Los Baños, so uh, our local LGU is really implementing that kind of collection for our garbage. And now for, I guess, the three of you, uh, most of our participants are uh, uh, trying to ask this question. Usually, sustainable packaging is more expensive than the usual ones. As much as we want to switch to sustainable packaging because of its cost, it's, it makes us retain with our usual packaging. What's your take on this? I guess uh, each one will have your time to answer that and give your thoughts. Maybe. I'll go first, Clark, if uh, yes. that helps the team. <laughs> yes. Where you apportion costs is, is a really interesting topic. <clears throat> I'm presuming for the moment that the, the person asking the question was talking about the unit cost of purchase of that particular material. So if it's that much more expensive than your conventional, I suggest you've still got a, an extensive conversation to have with your supplier. And if that supplier isn't answering your questions, perhaps it's time to go and look for another one. The second part of the, the point is, is the total cost from beginning to end through the supply chain. And that's where the food waste question comes in. <clears throat> and also the recyclability, if you like, from the consumer's point of view, what do they do with the packaging at the end? Nerida touched on life cycle analysis there, and that's a very, very useful tool to employ to understand what are the true costs throughout the entire supply chain, not just focusing purely on the unit cost. So I would, it would be a nice long discussion with that person asking the question, but I think we need to look at total end-to-end -end cost, not just the unit cost before they come to that conclusion. But there are alternative materials out there, and that's part of the review that I put forward in my presentation that you need to understand what are your choices. Over yeah, to think, either Nerida or Mr. Yeah. Lau. Uh, well, I, I think that also it's, it's down to your responsibility as a company to, if you decide that your company from the CEO up is going to be sustainable, then you need to actually look at that from your all the way through your supply chain to your packaging. So um, I would question the, yes, there is obviously going to be some cost sometimes for trade-off, but if you're actually committed to a plastic pledge or a part of a target or a global STG, then you can't have it both ways. Um, interestingly, many of the world's star winners this year, they absorbed the costs. They made the decision from the top down that it was critical for them to replace to go to RPET or it was critical to go to a fibre-based 
tray and they absorbed the cost. They didn't add them onto the consumer. So I think that I would say, look inside your company for your sustainable um, objectives and action plans. And maybe you have to absorb the cost. Commissioner, your thoughts? Um, yeah, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll make a response based on a few in uh, the mark is a very cost uh, or price shift in cost to consumer uh, will easily shift uh, to our unbranded uh, the, the products uh, that are, are uh, even substandard. No? Um, so I think uh, there is also a need as we go along to educate the public uh, that, uh, to, to, uh, to improve the choices that they make when they do purchases. Um, it really depends on the market segment that you are reaching out to. Um, and part of the roadmap that we are developing is that uh, the cost becomes high, uh, again, based on economies of scale. If you have more in the cost down uh, and you have to you know, put in the end of life uh, cost to a packaging and the, uh, the, the cost to the environment to help, you know, when, you, when you look at it, again, it's, it's a holistic view that everybody needs to look into. Uh, and what's important is for us also to look at, um, at uh, uh, you know, uh, promoting the advantage of doing what we need to do to take care of our environment. Thank you for that, Commissioner. Thank you for that, Narida and Ralph. Of course, uh, time is not on our side. Uh, we have lots of uh, questions uh, uh, on our chat box and we will actually answer all those questions. Then we will also, our team will also email it to you and also address those questions to our speakers and get back to you for the answer. And that's it. Thank you for participating in our Q&A portion. For everyone, we would like to remind you again that after this webinar, you will be redirected to our survey form. Please answer the survey to help us serve you better in our next events. So with that, uh, there you have it. That's all the time we have for today. Thank you, everyone, for joining us. We appreciate your time and your participation. The presentation materials, except, the, except of the speakers, are owned and copyrighted by Informa Markets. The speakers are solely responsible for their content and opinions. On behalf of our guests, Ms. Nerida Kelton, MAIP, Mr. Ralph Moyle, FAIP, CPP, and Commissioner Christian Lau, I am Clark Nabrao. Thank you for your time until next webinar episode of ProPAC Philippines. Have a great day. Thank you.